So, hey, I'm Shavik, and today I'd like to share with you Thumbprint, a new type of authentication system we developed uh, to be more socially inclusive, and this is work that I did with Gerard, uh, his advisor Chris Harrison, and my advisor Jason Hong at CMU. So, Thumbprint is basically a system that authenticates and identifies individual members of a small local group through their expression of a shared secret knock. Now, the secret knock is basically any small solid token tapped in a regular pattern on a surface instrumented with an accelerometer and a microphone. And as you can see in the video, after a group registers a shared sort of secret knock, if they re-enter that knock the way they registered it, they gain access. Otherwise, their access is denied. And that's kind of cool, but I want to emphasize here that the cool part about Thumbprint is not necessarily the method of interaction, but it's this more general idea that Thumbprint allows a small local group of people to share just one secret knock in order to authenticate, but these individuals can still be identified so they don't need to keep secrets from one another. So this property might be useful for a wide spectrum of small local groups who collectively own and share resources um, that have a lot of physical security already uh, and just need, as my advisor puts it, enough security to keep bozos from poking around where they're not welcome, right? And this could be families uh, of, uh, of people who share you know, game consoles like an Xbox or a Nest thermostat or whatever smart appliance du jour. Um, you know, work teams that share kitchenettes filled with snacks and meeting rooms that they don't want other, other teams to come and steal, as well as classrooms of students who, st who share, you know, chemical beakers and share tablets and things of that nature. I mean, the whole plot of Breaking Bad wouldn't have happened if they had thumbprint because, you know, the school administrators would know that it was Heisenberg who stole all of the chemical beakers out of the chemical lab. Um, for these sort of small local groups of people, divisive authentication that requires each individual member to sort of store their own secret and generate their own secret and jealously guard their own secret is often socially inappropriate and can create unnecessary social friction. Um, and it also creates this sort of structure where the security of the group is really only as strong as the person investing the least amount of effort in the security. So it doesn't really equitably distribute the responsibility for security for the group. But on the other hand, one way to overcome this is to sort of have this shared password system where everybody in the group shares the same password. But this is not ideal for situations where you want to personalize, you know, for example, a Netflix stream, or you want to have parental controls in the case of a father trying to share uh, an I a shared iPad with a child. Um, and it also precludes things like audit logs. And so going into this work, the key motivation we had was to create this system that sort of gave us both, both this inclusivity and, these, and this identifiability of the two strategies I mentioned before. And it's clear from the beginning, to create something like this, we kind of needed to broach beyond uh, the traditional sort of authentication um, uh, modalities that exist because, uh, you know, the traditional goals are one secret per person or one token per person or one body per person. Instead, we were sort of inspired by offline analogs for group authentication that have been in use for hundreds of years. For example, like the selective uh, pressure in handshakes used, allegedly used by the Freemason Society, as well as the biblical example of um, the pronunciation of the sh sound that the Gileadites used to identify invading Ephraimites. And in fact, it turned out that there was an offline analog for group authentication that perfectly lent itself um, to sort of the construction of a socially inclusive authenticator. And these were secret knocks that were famously used by Prohibition era uh, speakeasies when sale of alcohol was illegal in the US. Basically, there'd be a bouncer standing on the other side of the door, and you would enter a secret knock. And if you entered it correctly, the bouncer would know that you're, you know, you're in the know. You somehow came to know the secret knock, so you can have some moonshine. But if you entered the wrong knock, then the whole operation would get cleared out, and everybody would have to stay sober, so it was high stakes. Now, secret knocks are great because not only is there a single shared secret, but the expression of that secret may be variable enough to identify individuals because everybody mechanically expresses these things slightly differently. And so that was sort of the key idea behind Thumbprint. Can we bring secret knocks into the modern world? So at a high level, Thumbprint works as follows. Users enter their secret knocks on a surface instrumented with an accelerometer and a microphone, um, which generates these uh, acoustic and acceleration signals on which we um, extract a variety of time and frequency domain features, on which we uh, run a combination of supervised and unsupervised machine learning to learn both the group shared thumbprint as well as the individual expressions of the thumbprint. And then finally, we can sort of regulate access control using a template matching scheme. Um, and this uh, regulation can occur through an electronic smart lock, or it can be, as the video shows, on a laptop or something of that nature. And all this sort of happens through three phases. The first of which, of course, is registration, where the group members sort of agree upon a shared secret, and each group member enters a certain uh, number of registration attempts in order to seed thumbprint with just enough data in order to learn the group expression of the shared thumbprint. Now, 
From the acoustic and acceleration signals generated from each of these registration attempts, I extract dozens to hundreds of you know, different uh, time and frequency domain features using standard DSP techniques, including you know, Fourier transformations and Debauchet D4 wavelet transformations. And the first step that I take uh, in order to sort of differentiate between each individual member who enters the same thumbprint is to use a supervised feature subset selection. Specifically, what we use here is correlation feature selection. And what this allows us to do is sort of pare down those dozens and hundreds of features into just a parsimonious set of you know, two to three to five or whatever it happens to be um, that best differentiate between the individual members of the group. And so what you would have then after that is sort of, you know, if you have two particularly discriminatory features, you'd have this sort of abstract two-dimensional space um, where each dot over here represents a registration attempt colored in um, by the individual group member who, uh, who produced that registration attempt. Uh, and you can see over here that, you know, in practice it's never this clean, but you can see some separation between the different um, group members. So what we do then is that Thumbprint learns the individual expressions of the shared secret by clustering attempts in feature space that are closer together. And uh, importantly, I, so we do this sort of at a per user level for a couple of reasons. One is to keep each sort of cluster, which will later become a template, um, internally consi consistent so that you, know, you only have uh, data points from an individual member for each template. Uh, and the other thing is to account for this concept of drift which is this idea that the first time you enter a thumbprint may be very different from the tenth time you enter a thumbprint. Uh, also, it might be different before and after you have your morning cup of coffee, for example. And so by clustering on an individual member basis, you can also sort of capture variations uh, between individuals instead of just um, you know, across individuals. Now, once this sort of thumbprint is transformed into feature space and we have these clusters, authentication really becomes a matter of comparing an unlabeled attempt in feature space to the existing templates that we've learned in the previous step. And so we do that by computing sort of the closest cluster distance in feature space for an unlabeled attempt. Uh, and then you can have a configurable threshold below which maybe you accept uh, 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 an unlabeled authentication attempt and above which um, you reject access. So in this case, for example, we would reject access because the unlabeled attempt isn't close enough to any of the learned clusters. So that's roughly how Thumbprint works. But to evaluate if it was effective, I really wanted to answer these other three questions, which was, can individual group members be distinguished? Remember, that's one of the selling points of Thumbprint. You only need one secret in order for each individual member to be distinguished. Can people enter their thumbprints consistently over time? You know, it's one thing to be able to enter the same secret knock 15 minutes after you last entered it, but can you do it the next day? Um, and casual but motivated adversaries be detected. Thumbprint's not really designed for perfect security, but it is designed to be an authentication system, so it'd be nice if people couldn't enter random knocks and you know, gain access. So to answer these questions, we ran a two-day in-person lab study with three groups of five participants. And on the first day, basically, participants were asked to sort of watch a video of a group shared thumbprint. And they were allowed to watch this video as long as they wanted until they felt comfortable sort of replicating that thumbprint themselves. Once they felt re comfortable replicating this thumbprint, they were instructed to enter sort of registration attempts themselves. Uh, so this is the registration phase that I was talking about before. And then they came back independently 24 hours later and the first thing they had to do was replicate what they had just done the previous day. So they were given no memory cues. They had to enter their thumbprint again to see if they could consistently enter it the way they did the previous day. And after they had done that, they were then asked to break other groups' thumbprints as one of four different adversaries. So as you can see over here, the four different adversaries we tested were the token-only adversary that was given the, small, the correct small solid object but had to reconstruct the pattern themselves. The sound-only adversary was given a sound file of one of the group members entering uh, the correct thumbprint, uh, but they had to figure out which token to use as well as how to, how to replicate that. The video plus wrong token adversary was given an over-the-shoulder perspective of uh, one of the group members entering their thumbprint, but was not allowed to use the correct token. And then finally, the video plus correct token adversary uh, was, of course, a, a given that same video, but was also able to use the correct token. So we basically trained Thumbprint on the registration data we collected from the first day, and then we tested Thumbprint on the, both the actual and the adversarial replications of the group shared Thumbprints on the second day. Um, and so this sort of gives us some, some sort of notion of whether or not people can consistently enter their Thumbprints, as well as whether sort of different types of adversaries can break into Thumbprint. Now, 
This graph basically shows the result. Uh, the y-axis over here is the mean closest cluster distance, which is what I was talking about before, and so you can sort of threshold on that value in order to uh, make your authentication decisions. And the x-axis shows the different sort of user types that we tested, with the correct member, of course, being the real user, uh, being compared against his or her own templates, and the wrong member being uh, other members of the same group being, uh, being compared against other members of that group's uh, shared thumbprints. And, uh, all of the blue bars being the different adversaries. So you can see immediately that the uh, correct member has a much lower mean closest cluster difference even from um, attempts uh, entered 24 hours after the original uh, registration data. And if you sort of threshold, if you set that authentication threshold at approximately 0.45, uh, you can get a nice uh, equal error rate of approximately 12% with less than 5% uh, misidentification, which of course is not perfect security, which was not the goal, but it is comparable to other behavioral biometric uh, authentication systems that have been published, like Keystroke Dynamics, um, as well as uh, rhythm-based authentication systems like Tap Songs and Rhythm Link. And so the basic point here is that you can sort of get that level of performance while also getting these social inclusivity goals that I was talking about before. So going back to those uh, questions we, answer, we asked in our evaluation, uh, can individual group members be distinguished? Um, the answer appears to be yes, with very low misidentification rate. Can people consistently enter their thumbprints over time? The answer again appears to be yes, because again, we tested on data collected 24 hours later. And then can casual but motivated adversaries be detected? And the answer appears to be mostly, it's not perfect security, of course, but you know, a, lot of these, uh, a lot of these adversaries were given basically every advantage uh, that a casual adversary could have, including 10 attempts to replicate the thumbprint. Um, and the other thing that I want to mention, though, is that I only had 10 training data points per user. In a real deployment, when you, you know, when thumbprint's being used for days, weeks, and months, you can potentially have many more training data points, in which case we could employ uh, more sophisticated machine learning algorithms, like one class uh, classifiers and anomaly detection algorithms as well. So I, I expect all this performance to be better. This is more sort of a proof of concept of the of the idea. So looping back around to that original motivation of creating an inclusive uh, group authenticator that identifies individuals, it appears that Thumbprint does pretty well. It's certainly not perfect and you shouldn't store any nuclear codes behind it, but if we can relax sort of the assumption that we always require high strength authentication and instead create security for a broader socio-technical context, Thumbprint provides some evidence that we can have sort of the social intelligence that we want without letting go of the security go goals that we as a community value. However, while Thumbprint is this sort of promising first step towards a future of socially intelligent cybersecurity systems, it really is just a first step. And I'd be remiss if the, per, if the perceived takeaway from this talk was just that Thumbprint is the solution to all of our authentication woes. I'm certainly not arguing that at all. I do think it shows a lot of promise uh, as a socially inclusive authenticator for situations where that's appropriate. But instead, I hope to convey to you a more general sort of idea, which is that as we enter an era of where sort of computing increasingly pervades our physical world, the business of securing these computing systems is increasingly interfering with our social lives. Yet security to today is basically totally socially agnostic. If the decision a user has to make is between sort of higher security and losing social capital with a friend or loved one, the answer is always pretty much obvious and it's not in the favor of security. So our existing models of security and usable security should evolve uh, to have sort of a, a better understanding of social context. So rather than end with sort of this bold statement about how Thumbprint's gonna change the world, I'd instead like to end with sort of a question, which is how can we close the gap between the social requirements and the technical capabilities of interactive cybersecurity systems? Thumbprint is an initial exploration into, this, into the design space of systems that tackle this increasingly important problem, and I think it shows a lot of uh, promise, but what else can we do next to bridge this gap? I'm curious to hear your perspectives, and I'm also happy to answer any other questions you might have. Hi, I'm uh, Chris Hartledge from Fraunhofer Bonn, Germany. Um, have you investigated the effects of um, phone accessories like uh, screen protectors or like uh, soft shell cases on the accuracy of the system? Um, good question. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs>
because I, I imagine that like this it sounds different with like a screen protector or like a soft shell case or whatever. So if, it might uh, be interesting. I have not investigated that effect, but I will say that as long as the registration data and the testing data is uh, in the same conditions, I don't see. A yeah, but um, I registered it without the screen protector. Maybe then put it on. That's what would be interesting. Maybe so. Yeah, right. For if, the future, if, maybe. If you yeah. change the registration and the testing conditions, then yeah, that could uh, okay. that could certainly have an effect. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, I'm Susan from Nielsen Norman Group. Um, I'm wondering, did you do any testing with uh, video surveillance? Um, could you could you describe a little bit uh, more? Uh, well, about? we live in a world with almost ubiquitous video surveillance, mm -hmm. and it seems to me that this may create a very obvious pattern to follow for someone who has the ability to watch the video later of someone authenticating. So I wondered if you tried that. Well, not directly in those terms, but one of the adversaries I tested, the video plus correct token adversary, was somebody who had a video from an over-the-shoulder perspective of somebody entering the thumbprint and had like all of the other things required to replicate that thumbprint. So in a sense, yes, but not like more broadly in the sense of uh, you know just video sur surveillance more generally. Hi, Ben, uh, UCSB. So um, this is interesting because you've got this two-dimensional problem you're trying to solve with authentication, uh, sort of, of with a larger group and yet sort of individual identification. But the two have to basically share and divide up a sort of a dimension space where you're trying to add some set of you know, freedom, degrees of freedom when you enter in the code. Um, I guess the question I have is um, these sort of knocks that you have, is it a sufficient large, sufficiently large space? And at some point, if you require more security, have you guys thought about additional sort of modalities that will increase the space so that you can do better uh, mm -hmm. sort of spatial separation between the authentication of the group and the individual recognition? Um, yeah. Um, so I would say that um, we haven't necessarily looked at multimodal authentication as a actually practical, practically implemented space, but it's something we talked about. For example, uh, during the registration phase, you could require Thumbprint to be part of a two-factor authentication system in order to seed Thumbprint with enough registration data and employ more sophisticated machine learning algorithms. Um, uh, more generally, uh, I guess we, we, we have this nice property with increasing the number of group members in the group where you can have uh, sort of more features that represent uh, the different groups because when you have more data, more training data, you can have more features without overfitting the data. And so as you, ha as you add more group members to you, your group, you can also sort of increase the feature space that you're dealing with. Um, so that's, that's really the only thing that I would say, but we haven't actually empirically tested any of this. Hi, uh, very cool concept. Um, I think one question that I have is, uh, I don't know if you, have considered like maybe the F the effect of how users hold their phone or in terms of like to isolate only the thumb, mm -hmm. uh, whether you think that has had some effect in your data. But what I mean by that is say if a certain group is supposed to hold a phone in certain manner and yeah. then like the, the, the strength that they make against the phone when they tap it or things like that. Yeah, so we, did, we did an initial uh, feasibility study that I didn't really talk about um, mm -hmm. where we did sort of test different orientations of holding the phone. Um, it, ultimately, we used linear acceleration, so we sort of tried to filter out the gravity vector from all the acceleration Got information it. that we used, mm -hmm. and it didn't seem to affect things very much, but yeah, cool. conceivably. Thanks. <laughs> cool. So, Dan Cosley, Cornell. Uh, so, first of all, you owe Mark Ackerman a dollar for that last slide. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, Absolutely. But, but second, right?